Um, OCO Tahijo, this is Fiber Gray Wolf reporting from Native Planet, New York. Today we have a very special guest and a friend of mine, uh, Professor Evan Pritchard, uh, authors of such books as No Word for Time, Native New Yorkers, Native American Stories of the Sacred, Henry Hudson and the Algonquins of New York, Wholehearted Thinking, Earth at the Crossroads, and other books. I invited Evan here today because um, he gave me some vital information pertaining to my uh, own neighborhood, which is Class and Point. And I was very shocked at the um, information. Uh, I take my children there every day and we play. And I um, didn't know that it had so uh, much rich history. So, Evan, can you tell me the name of your latest book? Yeah, it's Henry Hudson and the Algonquins of New York. Uh, that's the title. It'll be out in the stores in September. Bye. And uh, it does mention Claflin's Point. Uh, you know, it's where the uh, Bronx River comes out. And uh, there was a wampum factory there where they would take the wampum shells from the shoreline. They would collect them there and they would uh, drill the holes in them and shape them into beads. And uh, they would either pile them or have artists create the wampum strokes that were very beautiful and then people would come for miles around, hundreds of miles, to uh, trade for those uh, wampum beads and for those strokes or, or belts. Can you tell me what nation of people live there? You know, the Siwanoi live there. And um, you said they're a part of the Confederacy of the Wampanoag. The, the way I describe it is that the Siwanoi and the people above them were the uh, people of the coastline and then the people on the other side of what we now call Route 22 for the people of the, the Hudson River Valley. And when the rain fell, it would fall on that, that ridge trail, which is called Route 22, and the water would either flow on the right or to the east, or to the left or to the west or to the Hudson, and the people identified with that water. But there was really, as far as I could see, very little other difference between the Siwanoi on the east and the, the Wappingers, such as the Rechewanka on the left. Yeah. So that's, that's that's how uh, my understanding of how they divided themselves up. So the Sioux and I were part of the Wapters Confederacy, um, and they were also, in a sense, like a different side of of the family, just because they're on the east. And Sioux and I often they say it either means that uh, those wampum strokes or belts, or it means the uh, that they're near the the sea, basically. But I think it probably more likely means that it's uh, the wampum people. I have a lot of Taino friends. Could you tell me how they interplayed in that history? Sure. Well, the thing is that the Mohican were here uh, and were standing on this land up to about uh, 1000 AD, just Mohicans, and then, you know, Muncie influence, and then about 1300, these uh, Tainos are coming up from the Caribbean and settling in Long Island and mixing in with the people creating the Matawak culture. And then again, about the same time, 1300, they just, a lot of them came right up the uh, Hudson River and intermarrying with all these Mohican and Lenape, creating a new culture which was called, originally it was called Wampanoos. But when those Taino came in, they had to change the name because Wampanoos mean people of the East, and you can't call the Taino people of the East. So they changed it to Wapping. Muwapingus, which meaning the possum people. We didn't see as no fur on his tail or little white face. So then it became Muwapingus or Wapingus, you see. And then, so when people from New York go to see Wapingus, Wapingus Falls, they're actually pronouncing it correctly. But the Taino influence is tremendous, very tremendous, and through many different phases, not just in 1300, but 1000 BC, there were Tainos coming up. And trading, and in Newburgh, New York, which is right across the river, in 1963 they found a Taino panther sculpture, a little statuette, dated to 1000 BC, right in Newburgh, deep under the ground. So there's no way nobody dug in and put that there. That was there from the Taino from 3,000 years ago. So Henry Hudson was not the first tourista to come up the Hudson River. The Tainos have been doing it for thousands of years. Wow. Why was uh, Classen Point such an important area? Um, I, I, I'm trying to understand, um, it, it was a central point to make um, wampum 
Um, but I had learned in the past that wampum was made out just in the Shinnecock area of Long Island. I know Cherokees make wampum. Why was, uh, in your own words, quickly, that such an important area? Well, the, the wampum doesn't, I mean, there's not a lot of wampum that you harvest there. I mean, they don't have a lot of Quahog shells there. Um, you know, Shinnecock territory, you have a lot of the wampum, a lot of the Quahog shells, and all up and down Narragansett's and Montauk's. But that was a good distribution point, partly because of the Iroquois, or the Mohawks in particular. They were way up north, and they needed wampum belts. They needed, you know, the wampum itself in order to really make treaties that were binding. So uh, they made beautiful wampum belts. So it was very easy for them to come down the Mohawk River, come down the Hudson River, which was called by Algonquins, Mohicani took and right down, you know, to Manhattan, cross over, either go around the bottom of Manhattan or come across land to the Harlem River, then over to that spot, or get in the Bronx River Valley and come down that way. And then they collect the wampum on their boats, they go all the way back up the Hudson River. For them, that was very easy. But also, people from Long Island could also go easily through the East River to that same spot. So it was by boat, it was very easy to get to. I say by land, not so easy to get to. But it was a kind of a, a port almost that a lot of different tribes could easily, um, you know, get near, put the wampum on the boat and go home. Okay, Evan, could you um, tell me the name of your latest book once again and tell me briefly what topics it covers. Um, it's coming out in September. Uh, give us the correct name. Okay. In September, uh, Council of Books of Oklahoma will come out with a book called Henry Hudson and the Algonquins of New York. It's a large book. It's a sequel to Native New Yorkers, which I think a lot of your viewers may have already read. Um, and it's a comprehensive treatment of Henry Hudson's uh, ship's log, which was written by Robert Jewett, plus uh, things by Henry Hudson himself and interpreting it and also then after interpreting it according to, uh, you know, scholarship. Then I wrote in what I felt was the missing side of the story because Hen uh, Henry Hudson's uh, first mate, if you want to call him that, was writing everything from a purely Euro European perspective. He, you know, he didn't have a lot of insight into what the people were thinking. And so I had to create the, you know, opposing views by creating similar diaries that could not actually have been written in the same way, but to create the other side of the story, you read fictional native characters who, who never existed, but their counterparts existed, saying, looking at it from their point of view, and, and again, I, you know, I, I ask for the readers uh, to, for a moment, to suspend judgment, <laughs> and to read it, um, not not those parts as a historical document, but as a reconstruction of history. So there's a little bit of fiction in the story, but most of the nine-tenths of the book is, is very solidly researched with hundreds and hundreds of footnotes and relying very heavily on, um, you know, little known previous uh, written sources. Okay, Evan, I know you're getting ready to do a lecture at uh, Pow Wow up in Wappinger Falls. Mm -hmm. Can you tell my audience how they may get in touch with you by email? Okay. Yeah, well, they can go to my website, www.algonquinculture.org. And that has a list of events on it, and uh, there's many events this year. And also they can uh, call 212-714-7151 for those in the New York City area. It's very easy to do. And uh, also there's P.O. Box 1028, Woodstock, New York, 12498. They can write me a letter. Oh, Evan, thank you so much. I enjoy you every time I see you. Well, and I'm you. looking forward to reading your book. And everyone write Evan and tune into his website. Thank you. Thank you.